your brothers. You were kind of on your own and standing up for yourself. A lot, but my little brother was the one who said, my brother Todd, he said that his girlfriend told, he told his girlfriend everything that my mom did to us. And, and um, she said that she was a teacher at a school. And she said that, I think your mother has Munchausen by proxy. So my brother told me that. And then that's when I looked it all up and I was like, yeah, everything sounded like it was just right. Like that's what she has. So, so after that happens, um, you have uh, three children, correct? I have three beautiful children. I have a daughter, Crystal, and another daughter, Tiffany, and a son, Tyler. And your first child, um, how old were you when your first child was born? I was 23. 23. And um, they were only 18 months apart, my girls. Right. Did, my son came. What, what, was your grandmother or your brothers or anybody else involved, or did they affect in any way um, your ability to raise your children prior to all the legal stuff happening? Well, just my brothers, you're saying? Well, your brothers and your mom. My mother would interfere in ways. Uh, sometimes it was tricky. She would be helpful or, or not helpful at all, make things worse. My younger brother, uh, Todd, he, he tried to be helpful because I was raising my girls alone without their dad because their dad was extremely abusive. He, um, he was physically abusive. He uh, bashed my head against the wall and I saw stars. And he also ripped my hair out so hard that he removed part of my scalp. So I, so my younger brother was helpful. But when it came out about him telling about my mother having Munchausen by proxy, he didn't want anybody to know about what happened to us when we were children. He was embarrassed and ashamed. So it's like he came out of his shell, and then he went back into it. And then he started telling lies against me about it rather than come forward. So ultimately, ultimately, um, you were hospitalized. Could you tell us about what led up to that? The, my brother, my brother Todd was encouraged by my mother because my mother was getting involved with my kids. Um, so my mother was trying to try to get one of my friends to call it in as a mental health check for me and my friend told me later after it happened to me but so my mother encouraged my brother to do the same I believe and he did it he he said a lie he said that I wanted to kill myself and kill him in which I never said honestly I I still love my brother even even though what he did was horrible and he never should have done it I can understand it's hard for him to come out with the truth I know he has told other people the truth now and um, that he doesn't have his children around them now, but the damage that he did, I wish he would just come out with the truth about it, but he made one statement to them called the hospital or the police and said that I wanted to kill myself and kill him just with his statement. No other, I did nothing else to him. There's no police reports of me going to his house with any kind of weapon or any, any police report or action that I did or no sign of anything when they came here to my house at 10 o'clock at night on the February 17th to pick me up. What year I, was I had, no, had nothing. When you were picked up, what year was that? It was 2005, right. February 17th. So it was literally just on the basis of your, of your brother's statement that you were threatened to kill him and you threatened to kill yourself, that they go to your house at 10 o'clock on that evening and they, against your will, um, take you into custody, essentially. I don't, I'm not sure if there's a better way to put it. That's essentially what happened, is it not? It is. They told me that Dr. Lutz ordered me there, and that I had to go. So there was like, I bet there was four or five police officers, and there was a transporter van out there. And I had two, two beautiful golden retrievers in my home at the time. And I asked them, what should I do with my dogs? And um, 
So for the people was, um, that are that are unaware, there is a law in the state of New York back then. Um, there's since been some changes to it, but back then the law was essentially it was called mental hygiene law, which is a funny way to put it, but it provides that a person may be involuntarily involuntarily committed to a hospital when the person has a mental illness for which immediate inpatient care and treatment is appropriate for which is likely to result in serious harm to himself or others. The likelihood to result in serious harm as used in this article, it means substantial risk of physical harm to himself as manifested by threats or attempts at suicide. And her brother alleges both that he's threat that she's threatening to harm brother and herself. Um, the way that they were determining that back then was not based on any concrete evidence. It wasn't based on actual threats. It was just the mere allegation of a threat that if they thought were true, that they could literally confine you in a mental health facility until they thought that you were no longer a threat. And uh, Judy was confined for a period of 19 days before everything got sorted out. But after her after the, the, the duration of her confinement, after the 19th day, it didn't end there um, because they took other measures. As she, as recall, she has three children. Um, her children were taken from her, and it began this, in, this, this entire saga of civil lawsuits and dependency cases and family law cases um, and all kinds of stuff that really, it, it took 15 years of her life fighting all of these things because of the allegations of her brother, regardless of whether or not it was true. It sets off this this domino chain of terror on her life and really on her children's lives. So Judy, when you were confined, when they when they take you in, what happens next? Well they they bring me into the van and they they tie you down on to the mat. You know the whatever you want to call it inside the van. Right. So they wrap you up inside of there. I kept asking why, why am I, what did I do? I don't get an answer. And that hospital, that hospital is only a couple minutes away from my home, around the block and down the road, just like less than, less than two minutes. And they, they brought me in there and they, they had me go in this very small room, remove my clothing and put on a gown. And they did blood work and a urine test to see if I had any type of um, medication or maybe some sort of a substance. I mean, nothing was found. I told them that I was asking why it happened. And, you know, they just had pick up from a doctor order. They didn't still wouldn't tell me that it was who made the accusation or anything about it. They asked me lots of family questions and questions about my children. Um, and yeah, that's, so that part, did you have an idea who made the allegations? Did I? I'm sorry. Did you have an idea of who made the allegations against you that you were a harm to yourself? I, I didn't know anything. I didn't know who could. I said, well, I did say maybe my mother, because I believe she has munch housing by proxy. Right. Did say that. I don't, I, you know, I said that. Did they take but you serious when you didn't told take them me, that? They, they didn't take me serious at all. So they're running all Not these tests, and it sounds like they're trying to test you for if you have chemicals in your system, if you have drugs in your system. But when yeah, those they, tests came out negative, then what happens? They um, interviewed me, and then they took me upstairs. So there's two sides to the psychiatric ward. There's the really bad side, where more intense patients. And then there's the side where it's not as bad. Well, they took me over to the really bad side. After, after getting picked up 10 o'clock at night, they, they're downstairs and do an intake for, I, I don't know, probably three hours and then bring me up upstairs. Meanwhile, I have a very bad back from a riding lawnmower accident off a 10 foot embankment. I'm lucky that I have to walk. So I'm going through all that. They take me upstairs and do more intake. And a, one of the patients tried to come up near me and punch me in the face, but the guard got in between us and he, um, ended up punching the guard and giving him a bloody nose. That's how bad it is in the mental ward. Yeah. Then they brought me into a room and questioned me some more. 
and told me that that I had to stay there, basically. But they still did not tell me. I, I'm asking why am I here? Why am I here? What did I do? What did I do? There's no answer for that. Where are your children at this time? Um, well, my son, my son is here. My daughters and my son and I have a very close relationship. My daughters, they moved to Maryland because the custody of my daughters was first given to the Munchauser by proxy. Then one daughter emancipated herself. I, I apologize. So they, I meant at the time that you were in the in the mental health facility. Um, where all, were your children at that time? They were all here. Okay. So there and, and what happened to them while you were while you were uh, being held? There was already, I think there was a partly a court thing. Oh, I filed a petition for court. And so that, and Tyler might've been with his dad that day, like, um, because we had joint custody. So Crystal and Tiffany were 16 and 17, you know, they weren't here that night. So. So eventually you ended up filing a petition to be released from the mental health facility. And then your children... <laughs> All right, but there was already a CPS report started right. then. So see, I, my daughters might have already been with the mother. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they opened up a dependency case. And prior to that, um, prior to you being um, held at the facility, um, what was the living arrangement between uh, you and your children? Well, I lived here in my house. I was a single mom. Um, I provided care for Crystal and Tiffany. When this happened, they were 16, 17. So I was their primary caretaker. Right. And my son, he was here most of the time with me because his dad gave up a lot of time. But we had joint shared custody. So Tyler was here half the time or more than half the time sometimes. How often would he see his dad? Half the time he was allowed, but sometimes he didn't pick him up yeah. back then. And yeah, I was I was out from a car accident. Someone hit me from behind in a red light. So I, I was out of work for a little bit at that point, a small amount of time. Uh, so I was walking my son to school every day. Um, so now you're um, going back to when you were uh, at the mental health facility. CPS takes your children. Um, there are family court papers in there. Yeah. And, and, emergency petition. Right. And what happened with that emergency petition? What were the allegations against you? Um, it was more about mental health, because that's a perfect time to send me an emergency petition. Yep. Mental health, not stable. Some boyfriend by the name of Ron Thomas, who is a person who sold me my home, who is not my boyfriend, never was my boyfriend, never had a date with the man. He was a high school friend, but he just sold me my house. That's all that he did. So there was allegations in there about some man that was my boyfriend that had things wrong with them. Maybe they were on drugs or something. All right. So if they're, if they're going to old boyfriends, then the allegations were initiated by, do you even know who the allegations were initiated by? Yes, they were initiated by, by um, Troy Mackey, my ex-husband. Okay. So he opened up a CPS case. And the you... CPS case was encouraged by my mother. Okay. And, and I, I mean, you, when you get, I got copies of the CPS reports and, and I got the finding taken off of my name because I used to be a mandated reporter and inspect um, daycares and take care of children and, and, and also like do like video conferences and trainings for daycare providers. So when you get those CPS reports, which I ordered them got the CPS finding off of my name years later, there's no names on there. So you don't really know who did it. You can sure. probably figure it out somewhat, but However, there's no However, um, you, I mean, for your entire life, you were, were victimized uh, by your mother. Um, she was a Munchausen by proxy, as, as you had stated. And then I'd imagine when you guys had court hearings, did she go to court to testify that you had mental health issues? She did. She told she told the hospital when I was in there that I was schizophrenic, that I was bipolar. She told them that that was all inside the, the hospital record. It was also in the CPS allegations. Um, she 
she testified that I couldn't learn. All three of us couldn't learn. She told the judge in family court and that she believed that I, or said that I have because my father had schizophrenia in which my father never had schizophrenia. So there was never any medical documentation other than the allegations by your mom that you had any of these issues? No, not even in the hospital. They never diagnosed me after two weeks of being in there with any kind of diagnosis of bipolar or schizophrenia. So how did you ultimately be released? I, I was given an attorney by the hospital. And when I was given that attorney by the hospital, I had to wait for a hearing to get released. And the judge ordered me out because I had no signs of danger to myself or anyone else. And they had no diagnosis for me at all. So he ordered me out, Judge Bradley. Okay, so after you're out, now your children are elsewhere. So I'd imagine that ins that started the entire uh, dependency court proceedings trying to get your children back. Um, could you explain how all of that started? What were you told by CPS as far as what you needed to do to get your children back? They didn't tell me what I can do to get my children back. They told me what I needed to do to give my children away. They told mm. me that I needed to give them all my, my daughter's clothes and release release my son's things. Just based off of the mere, okay, so they have mere allegations that you have these mental health issues, but you haven't been diagnosed. So was there ever sort of like, for example, in California, they, there would be like a reunification plan. Like, okay, we have, we need to verify all of these different things. And she has to hit all of these benchmarks. And if she does, then we could reunify the children with their parents. Um, was there anything provided to you like that whatsoever? From CPS and family court, they said family court was taking care of it. CPS wrote a letter. Sharon Orson Lapp was the worker. She wrote a letter to Judge Mizell at the time. Mizell was the first judge that handled my court case in family court and left it up to the judge what to do. So they filed neglect charges on me, sent the letter to the family court judge without anything like what you asked. They had nothing. They had no diagnosis. They had, they had nothing. And um, they said that they were going to leave it up to the judge. In the family court. Neglect on me. Yeah. So the family court judge, I'm assuming, probably gave custody to your, or to the dad. Is that correct? I, um, there was emergency petition and I went there for that. It wasn't a hearing or a trial. It was just. Sure. And they removed Tyler from me immediately. My, my daughters were already with the Munchauser by Foxy, my mother, and, and the ordered them to be there. And without any evidence, without even a trial, with no plan to give him back, he was five. I was devastated. I couldn't even drive home. I pulled my car over and was screaming in my car that they took my baby and that I asked them, please. I asked the law guardian, I'm telling you, she's got Munchausen by proxy, you know? She did all these things. She's, she's lying to you. She's telling you this is wrong with me. It's not wrong with me. Please don't send my children there. Please don't do this to me, please. And um, I didn't have a hearing or a trial till two years later because they kept having conference yeah waiting for mental health evaluations to get conducted and done and when you wait for those you have to wait for people's insurance to pay for them sometimes and the process could take six months eight months so, all that time just going by without your children just so the the people understand here's what essentially happened so judy is taking in She's held for 19 days on the basis of what happened to her being incarcerated essentially for 19 days in a mental health facility. The father of the children files an ex parte emergency petition in family court to gain full custody of the children. Prior to that, the children, were, I believe, were 16 or 16, 14, and four. Is that right, Judy, at that time? They were. Yeah. So that entire time prior to that, Judy is the full-time single mother of these children and dad has visitation rights. 
Now there's a false allegation brought against her by her brother that's perpetuated by a mother whom had previously victimized her while she was a child um, as a Munchausen by proxy, um, claiming that she had these mental health disorders, that she was schizophrenic, that she had um, learning disabilities and all of these things. So the family judge sees all of these things without any evidence. She's saying that specifically because an ex-party emergency hearing is not based on any evidence. It's based on the possibility uh, that certain things might be true. And what they were saying about Judy was uh, she had, she's mentally incapacitated. She does not have the capacity to, to watch or care for these children. Uh, the children are in danger under her custody, and therefore we need temporary emergency orders to give full custody to dad. The judge seeing that she was um, taken in by the mental health facility, not knowing what was going to happen down the road, not knowing that there was no evidence to support it, not knowing that the allegations were false, something that wasn't proven for many years after the fact, then says, okay, on the basis of no evidence, other than I know that she's in a mental health facility, I'm giving custody to the dad. And Judy's describing that she's literally in a car and saying that um, the children were, I believe, uh, with your mother for a period of time. Is that correct, Judy? They were because she filed a petition too. Yeah. To take a guardianship petition, I'd imagine. Yes. And they gave them to her. Yeah. So she gives them. And then here's Judy screaming that, wait a minute. No, no, no. My mom has, she's a Munchausen by proxy. And she's trying to explain to the judge her situation. The judge is not pay paying her any attention because he, for all he knows, believes that she's mentally incapacitated herself. He grants the petition. And which may seem like an innocent thing, but years later, and yet Judy still doesn't have her children. At that time, 16 and 14, one of the children is now over the age of 18. Uh, the other is right up against the age of 18. And her four-year-old is now in the care of her mother. And, you know, dad is having more influence now. Um, and they're taking advantage of that scenario. And Judy is not, has not been offered any reasonable way to combat those allegations. It's like, hey, look. The hospital, the facility took you in, so something might be wrong. And you know what? That's enough for us. And you know what that sounds a lot like? That sounds a lot like the Maya Kowalski case where there's doctors, Shelly Smith, saying that, uh, look, I don't believe uh, that Maya needs these treatments. I think that her mother is uh, exacerbating her symptoms, and they're accusing mom of all of these things. And without so much as any evidence whatsoever, they take this doctor's opinion and they start making decisions, and now we're in dependency court, which is now where Judy finds herself. So, Judy, after all of that happens, um, you said it, it took you two years uh, to get uh, any changes to those what were supposed to be temporary emergency orders. Could you explain what happened uh, when you were able, um, after two years, to get those orders changed? First, first, first it was uh, our supervisor. I had supervised. I had supervised. I was supervised by my ex-husband, the person that lied. Um, I was <laughs> I had supervised visits for an hour. Let's unpack that for a little bit. So you're, you're super. You're, you have visits with your children, but they're supervised by their dad, who is your ex. Is that accurate? Right. Well, I have two ex-husbands, so it was Tyler's dad. Okay. I would get a supervised visit for one hour by him, supervised. He was my supervisor. Did you guys have a good relationship prior to that or were, you, was it, were things contentious? No, he was verbally abusive and hmm. he also lied in the petition. He wasn't He wasn't sure. working things out. Prior, prior to when this all started, I filed a violation petition on him for not following through in the, in the, before the emergency petition, before any of that started to, to, get him to follow the order that he wasn't following because the violation petition. And because he's supervising your visits, basically he's giving reports to the judge about how your visits with the children are going. And so yeah. he has a significant influence over what happens next. Was that accurate? I, so then I told my attorney at the time that, that he's lying to them. Why would anyone let my ex-husband be my supervisor? So then they allowed the place where I used to work to be my supervisor. Family would suck. They have supervisors there. 
Exactly. How did your um how did it how did the judge reconcile what your attorney was trying to say about your husband making false allegations against you and changing him from being a supervisor? Most of a lot of the times it was the lawyers that were working out it back and forth and then presenting it to the judge and the judge agreeing yeah. either it could be switched or it couldn't be. All right. So after, um, how long did it take? Well, how, for how long were your visits with your children supervised by, um, their dad? Uh, I would say about three months. Okay. Um, it took a while to get my supervised visit anyway. And did your visits increase with your children after that? Slowly, like the pace of a snail or a turtle. And so you had about an hour a week prior to that. What was it after that? At one point, it got, I graduated where I was allowed to have every other weekend supervised by a friend of mine that lived in Port Jervis. So I was allowed to drive down to Port Jervis about an hour and a half with my son alone to be unsupervised, to be supervised all weekend by a friend who also had children. Explain to people what supervised visits with your children are like when you've been raising them since birth and all of a sudden you have to be babysat to yourself while you're interacting with your children. What is that like? It was extremely humiliating, heart-wrenching, painful. Uh, you're, you're judged. Um, one of my neighbors said, white trash, are you ever going to get your kids back? Hmm. So you're judged by the people that you used to have as friends. You're judged by your neighbors because people remove your children for no reason. And they don't understand the whole inside story. And what it looks like from the outside is maybe I really did do something wrong. So when you go to pick up your child, you just can't wait to spend that hour with your child. And you get real selfish with that time. Mm -hmm. You don't let anybody else around just so you could enjoy him. And then when I used to drive him back to drop him off to his dad, I would just drive around for hours so that I didn't have to come back home because you could hear a pin drop in this house. And my house used to be like Grand Central because my daughters had a lot of friends and they all came here and my son had friends that he played outside on the street with that I sat out there with him. Everyone gravitated towards my home. So it was very painful. It's really hard to describe because the pain, it's so deep. It's so, so deep. And it creates a really huge hole in your heart. How did it affect your children? I think my son was really confused. He was four, so I don't I don't think he understood. Uh, I asked him when he got older. My daughters were very confused too. They were they were upset and mad at me. They were confused. They told me later that um like I was the person they depended on. So when people were saying that there was something wrong with me, they didn't have me. They didn't have their attachment figure. So at that time, they felt extremely confused. Sometimes they weren't always nice to me because they were being told lies by my mother. So all of this is going on and your children are starting to have these opinions about you. What measures were taken by anybody to ensure their comfort or emotional stability during this entire process? Uh, my daughters weren't ordered any type of therapeutic intervention. My son wasn't offered any therapeutic intervention till way into the custody arrangement because the law guardian at that time said that my son wouldn't talk to her. And I said it very nicely, but I said, listen, you took him away from his mom. Why would he want to talk to you? He tells me everything. You know, he, he doesn't know you. He knows that, that he has to know at some level that that somebody was in charge of taking him away from his mom who nursed him who, who had a home birth for her son who never hurt him so they decided to order him therapy 
in his teenage years to try to get him to open up to say what he wanted hmm. here and saying what he wanted and my daughters they they had to go on basically my daughter emancipated herself my older daughter and right. she was out very early that was uh, your middle child correct the one that emancipated herself the older child my first daughter the eldest. okay from yeah. your perspective what were some of the concerns uh, that the judges were focused on during the custody hearings? Like what questions they want you to answer? Well, during the trial, they would ask me different types of types of things that I would, that I was doing with Tyler because Crystal and Tiffany, Crystal emancipated herself and Tiffany, they ordered Tiffany to go with her dad and um, down in Maryland where she was abused by him too and sent to a hospital because he beat her just like he beat me. I got phone calls about that from her. So, I mean, at any point was your ch were, were your children's voices heard in, during this process at all? There was a time when I believe Tyler was brought in for a Lincoln hearing. That's what they called him, right? Right. Yeah. And, Tyler. Tyler was. And he and he and he did tell the judge, at least he told me he did, that he. And I know he did because the law guardian told me that he did, that that he wanted to be with both his parent. He wanted to be with his mom and his dad. So. How long into the process did that take? Like how many years are we in, since they've been taken from you? It was more when Tyler became a teenager. So he was, he was four when he was first taken and. At, you know, almost being five. So it was probably more like around 13, 14, something like so that. So we're talking about years, years and years. Yeah. Have some therapy in between. But you see, he had fear too because my mother was telling him things. My ex husband let my mother have him. So my mother was telling him that she's afraid of me and she would tell my, my daughters and my son all these lies about me. So, yeah, it was. Well, so they've been telling lies about you since about 2005, as far as I can tell. At, at what point did that get reconciled where they dropped those allegations and then you could just parent oh, your I, children as normal? I filed a, a petition for a change of circumstances. Right. I, that if he could please file a change of circumstances, because in the order it said that I was to continue my therapy with Dr. Stephen Hermely. But the thing about Dr. Stephen Hermely was I hired him for my hospital case. So, and I've always gotten therapy through my life because of the abuse that I suffer, suffered at the hands of my mother. So I don't have a problem with that. You know, any good, even any good therapist would get therapy. So as you know, so I said, tell the judge that Dr. Hermely agreed that he's going to, he's going to release me and just continue my hospital case you know, for me to be a witness. And that's how I got my son back. So there was a doctor, um, Dr. Hermely. Is that how you pronounce it? Dr. Hermely? Yes, Stephen um, Hermely. Right. He wrote your letter and um, he had expressed some concerns. Well, I mean, he seemed just as frustrated as you in the case, but he writes this letter. I'm assuming that this was a letter that was presented in court. Do you mind if I read it? I don't mind at all. So it says, uh, I'm writing in response to your request that I discuss my impression of how your ADA rights have been addressed in your ongoing family court proceedings concerning your parental rights issues with your son, Tyler. And as you're aware, this case has been ongoing for over 10 years. So at this point, your son is over the age of, I mean, he's like 15, 16 by this point, if I'm correct. Um, it's true. And I have been involved almost that long as your psychiatrist. The case originally involved your two daughters as well, but they quickly aged out of the system. Uh, the case originated when you were involuntarily committed in the Benedictine Hospital Psychiatric Unit. You refused treatment, contested your commitment, and were released by the judge when your case was heard about two weeks later. Subsequently, in the course of the case of the family court requested mental health evaluations of all parties, the psychologist who evaluated you concluded that because 
you had been in the hospital for two weeks. You must have been seriously impaired, which is kind of what we just talked about. Um, for no other reason than you were involuntarily committed without any evidence whatsoever. Uh, they just said, oh, well, something must be wrong. Um, doctor goes on to say it was evident that the psychologist had not reviewed the record or he would have known the reason you were in the hospital for two weeks was that it took long that long to obtain a court hearing. I was subsequently prohibited from giving more than minimal testimony at trial as the report of the psychologist, which was apparently given great credence, was not allowed to be questioned or rebutted as I had been given a copy of his report without the concurrence of all parties involved. Subsequently, for 10 years, uh, your ex-husband's attorneys were, were permitted to describe you repeatedly as mentally ill in court. Despite my testimony at a number of hearings over the years that you were not mentally ill, but suffered from an anxiety disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, which did not impair you or preclude you from adequately parenting. Later, you then attempted to lodge a complaint against the psychologist who evaluated you with the New York State Education Department. They had to close the case as the presiding judge would not permit the report to be released to the New York State Education Department. This occurred even though they had a copy of the report you had sent them, which is why they opened the case in the first place. Apparently, the New York State Education Department acquired an authorized copy of the report. Thus, in summary, decisions adverse to your interests were apparently based in part on a report that couldn't be questioned, and when you attempted to have a professional review of the report by a regulatory agency that was barred by the court that repeatedly allowed you to be treated in a discriminatory and derogatory manner due to your psychiatric history. I believe the proceeding summarizes this type of discrimination you experienced, with the consequence being your son's ability to benefit from your parenting has been curtailed and your ability to contribute to his continued growth and development has likewise been curtailed. And it's signed by Stephen Hermley, MD. So much like in the Kowalski case, we have a similar uh, situation whereby you um, have competing professional opinions about what's going on. On the one hand, you have a doctor that's firmly in your corner that had a better grasp on all of the evidence and all of the issues on your case regarding your mental health. And they have this other report that is based on you being involuntarily uh, taken in by a psych ward without taking into consideration that there was a full-on hearing that allowed you to be released and they presented zero evidence supporting them taking you in. Um, and yet they're using that as the basis to railroad you in the family law case and in the dependency case, causing you to lose custody of your children, causing you to forever be impaired in your ability to raise your children going forward. You lost their ability to be your son's mother in the way that you had always envisioned. By the time all of this gets wrapped up, he's already 14, 15, 16 years old. And now what? So even if they go back and they make their corrections on the record, say, okay, well, yeah, she was not mentally uh, incapacitated in any way, and we were wrong, and sorry about that. I, I mean, <laughs> what is that even worth? What is that even worth? And I guess my question is, you and I had talked about off-air um, about Beata Kowalski and how everything that she was going through, and she only endured a few months of this. You've been going through this for 15 years. She ultimately ended her life um, because of the extreme despair and anxiety and, you know, depression that she felt. Um, what is your opinion, having gone through everything that you've been through um, and uh, Beata's reaction to everything that she was going through? How do you relate? How do you not relate? And what do you think about it? Well, my heart, my heart. Can, can definitely feel the reason why she might have chose to take her life because when somebody takes your children from you, child, the pain involved is is so bad. And you and if you feel like there's no hope and you don't have a lot of faith, maybe it's faith, maybe it's 
hope, but maybe it's, yeah, I, I can understand why she took her life, but I, I myself couldn't ever choose to do something like that because every night when I, when I looked up, I see the moon, right? And I told my children that I love them to the moon and back. So with that, I knew they're seeing the moon. I'm still seeing the moon and I'm going to fight a hard fight and try to get them back and never stop. So, you know what that reminds me of? There's the, this, um, I don't know if you remember it or not. There was a movie, an American tale and they have that song somewhere out there. It talks about the moon and then everybody looking at the moon to connect people that were separated by miles. It just, uh, it reminded me of that. But in yeah. your um, Christmas, I would put like yellow ribbons on my tree and on my wreath. And in my garden, I had a fisherman and I would put a yellow ribbon on it. Because just like in the war, they would hope that I felt like this was a war. This is a war. And I also felt like, I feel like that woman must have felt like her mind was getting twisted. Because when people are saying there's something wrong with you or that you did something to your children, it starts to play with your brain. And if I didn't honestly have Dr. Hermely through all that, and a lot of people who were loving to me and supportive to me and knew that there was no way that this could have ever been true, not everyone, a lot of family members weren't like that to me. And I have a, had a large family at the time and the court wasn't, it can really twist your brain up you can get caught into a dark place. And I, I honestly have cried every single day since this thing happened. And you don't know what direction to go. You don't, when you get up in the morning, you're usually like putting something in a crock pot or having to do something around your house. If you're a single mom with three kids in your house, you got to drive one kid here, one kid there. You got to make sure you have something for dinner. You got to drop one kid over at the daycare. You got to go to work and come home. There's not an empty moment. And at that time, my daughters were working. So I was a taxi driver and I enjoyed it and I loved it. There wasn't anything about it that I didn't love. I love being a mom. It was my, if you want to call the job, it was my best job ever in my whole life. I wanted to have children. I loved my children. I understand why that woman did it. Sometimes I say that people have guts to kill themselves, but I don't really know that I'm explaining that right because I don't have, I don't, I don't have what it takes to do something like that. I don't, and I wouldn't ever want to leave my children the legacy of that because, but I completely understand why she chose to do it. You know, from way out from an attorney's perspective, we take on these cases and, um, it's not the same, obviously, going through it as a, a party, you know, where your life is being affected by legal decisions that are being made. But, you know, we take on enough of these cases, we become emotionally invested, and we, they, 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 I guess the best way that I could put it is it saturates your soul. And so oftentimes when we are in there fighting these cases, we're in there on the front lines, and, you know, we experience the wins and losses in a much different way than you. And so when we look at these cases, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that you are dying on the inside while all this is going on. And we're so focused on the fight of it all, you know, the wins and losses of it all. When really our main focus is my personal focus as an attorney is on what's in the best interest of the children and trying to reunify the children with their mom. Who's been unfairly un unfairly, you know, penalized because of the allegations of the wayward few. And so in the case of Beata, I was sympathetic, but ultimately somewhat angry that she made the decision that she did because I felt like she had a winning case. Ultimately, I thought it would be resolved, but we didn't never, we'll never get to find out because 
she made that decision and now her daughter is, you know, on that documentary, her daughter has been um, traumatized by her mother's decision to do that. And um, it's hard for me to pass judgment on Beata because of everything that you, that you just described, but you um, yourself being facing just as much stress, stress and pressure as she did. How were you able to maintain your focus on your initial motivations um, and trying to get your children back, despite everything that everybody was saying about you, despite the deck so obviously being stacked, stacked against you, the fact that you had doctors in your quarter trying to tell the court one thing, and yet they're believing other things. How were you able to maintain your focus? I think I really had, I, I could really say thank you to my mother. And I don't usually call her mother, but um, I call her monster because that's what she is. But going through that much child abuse when I was young, she, she gave me, she gave me strength because I wasn't going to let her win. Just was inside of me since I was very little, I wasn't going to let her win. And when my dad passed away when I was little, when I was only 13, um, I, I was uh, thinking that maybe, you know, my dad, maybe, maybe he's with God. So I tried to find my dad with God, <laughs> thinking that maybe he was there. And then I found a deeper understanding of what God, a God, and I just, I had hope. I wouldn't give up on hope. But I really think it's just from what I've been through as a kid that I already been through the worst, right? This is worse because it's my kids, but I can't give up on my kids. I could give up on me maybe, but I couldn't give up on me because I couldn't give up on my, for my kids. Maybe I had to close my ears when I used to walk my son to school and I could hear all the other kids out on the street walking to school with their parents and I didn't have a son to take to school anymore. So I closed my ears or disassociate a lot to get through it but there was no way I was going to give up the fight no way in retrospect um, I know that your relationship with your children has been severely affected and irreversibly altered but have you been able to reconcile the things that have happened in court with your children since everything's kind of wrapped up? On and off, my, do my daughters would come and go, but unfortunately, from what I understand, my mother is still influencing my daughters. They did come here a few times and I cooked for them and they said, please don't tell anybody we come here. And I, I, I said I wouldn't, but Tyler did. And then they filed a violation petition on me because I, they said that I told Tyler not to tell that Crystal and Tiffany came here, but that wasn't the case. Crystal and Tiffany said that they didn't want anybody because they knew that they would be up what they'd be up against with it all, right? So, but they did come here and say that they missed me and they loved me and how it felt not to have me there when they had their child born or when they got married or like how it really felt and how much they really missed me. And on and off, I've been able to, with my younger daughter and with my son, yeah, we have a very close relationship now. We always did though, because I've had the supervised visitation that was a way to hold on, you know, to encourage it. There was more there at that time and my daughters were teenagers. So, so but not, we haven't had a Christmas together or holiday, any, any holiday. And your children, I mean, you're talking about they're grown and they're over here, they're still saying that they they can't tell people that they're going to go visit you? Um, that's what they said then. And then when they do, I understand that my brother and my mother check in to make sure that they're not. And even my mother called my aunt and was all excited that I wasn't, she called one of my aunts and said that she was all acting all excited that I wasn't invited to my daughter's wedding. At first I was, and then I wasn't. And my mother was all excited, but they put the pressure on them, right? Saying, oh, if, 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 if you have her, then they're not going or however they do it. They want to make sure that I'm not, a lot, I'm not reunifying with my children. 
That's really how it is. My mother has a lot of power to some degree. So does my brother. And I'm, and so my daughters too, they have mixed, mixed feelings about me. You know, on one hand, they want me. On the other hand, it's like, you could have a really weird relationship with a perpetrator that you don't understand. You love them, but you don't love them. You know, you look for their approval. I know because I look for approval from my perpetrators. I went in from a perpetrator mother to perpetrator husband. So, and that's what you seek. I learned that in therapy that you seek kind of like love and approval from your perpetrators. So I can understand why my daughters may be doing that. Sometimes they temporarily come back, but nothing consistent. And it's, it's hard to because they have kids now. And if I'm, if I would see their child and then they pull their child away from me, then I don't have my grandchildren. It makes it really hard. It's very painful. How old is your mom now? She's uh, about 89, I think. Yeah. Do you think a, there's a, any is, uh, mending with that relationship? They believe she has Munchausen by proxy. They believed me. So they believe me, but if somebody believes you, that somebody has something, then why don't they do something about it? Why? Why even the court said after a while, the law guardian, oh, we believe you. We believe you. After after some really bad things happen, they believe me. But what about turning it around? Or what about doing something about it? Like, I don't know what y'all can do, but I just want my family back. I just, I don't, I don't want my, my mother. I want my brother to get help because he lied. My one brother, my one brother died, but. I would like to see them. I would like to see something done. If you're asking for my answer to that question, even if they believe you, they find you credible, then why did they not change things? And why is still, why are things still the same? It, it wasn't a, that many episodes ago where um, I, brought, I brought up with my co-host. We were reading some of the legal decisions that were made in a case, you know, and um, oftentimes believing somebody is not the same as being able to do anything about it because of the system that's put in place. And one of the biggest complaints that I hear from lay persons that are not attorneys or parties to a case, and they're just hearing about these kinds of things is they say over and over again, the system is broken. There's no justice. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what the evidence is. The court's going to do what they, what they want to do. And as an attorney, it's really hard to concede that point. Yet I'm a practicing attorney and I can't concede that issue. I have to believe that if the evidence is presented a certain way, that there are mechanisms in place that are going to protect the best interest of children, if not falsely accused adults. And in my experience, there are some cases where that is true. But in other cases, such as yours, the system is set up where if they think that you have some kind of mental health issue, they can't make findings that the children should be returned to you until you're cleared of any suspicion of having a mental illness. And even if you have a, a, a doctor in your corner saying specifically, there is no mental health issue here. She's got anxiety, but nothing more. It's not affecting her ability to raise the children. If another doctor says something to the contrary, then it throws everything out of whack. And if you're asking me what the main issue with the system is, it's that we give experts, so-called experts, far too much power in that if I happen to be a doctor, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter if I'm a good or a bad doctor. It doesn't matter if I've reviewed your charts. It doesn't matter if I've corroborated certain allegations against you. The mere mention that you may have something wrong with you attached to the MD on the end of my last name will be enough to start a litigation chain of events that will result in your family being destroyed in an irreparable manner. Does it suck that that's the case? Yes. Is there anything that can be done about it? Sure there is. But 
right now, the way that things happen with you, the way that that law was situated, where literally, and then they even go on to mention the judge starts, he starts to explain that, look, they don't even have to be doctors necessarily. They don't have to have any evidence whatsoever that there was any reason to corroborate the allegations against her. If they think, and it's reasonable for them to think that there was something wrong, they could take her in without her, without her, against her will, which is what happened to you. And on the basis of that, all it takes is one wayward parent, your mother, and an ex to corroborate those allegations to walk into a family law court on an emergency basis and flip custody against you. And next thing you know, you have supervised visits with your children whom you've been raising more or less by yourself since they were babies. And if I have any takeaway from your case, it's essentially that. If you have a system where that can happen to anybody, it's fundamentally broken. And is there a way to change it? Yeah, but not from the lawyer side. The lawyers don't get to make the rules. The lawyers, they get to manipulate and argue the facts and argue how facts should or shouldn't apply. Legislators are the ones that set these rules whereby judges have to abide. And if you're asking where to fix it, it would be on the legislative slide, the legislate, the legislative side. We spoke there. A county legislation, I, I, I went there and spoke. And what happened with that? Spoke. They handed me over to a lawyer and then the, he said, he said, well, how do, I know if, um, how do I know if you're telling me the truth? His name was Cappy Weiner. And I said, because I'll show you it all on black and white papers. I will show you that everything that I said is the truth. And you want me to send that to you? And he said, no. And he re refused my stuff. And then I said, I'm not. I'm not in any doubt why you don't want to see my things because since I started looking into things, you know, about the county legislation and the funding where the money came from, um, you know, CPS funding and foster care funding, they're the ones that approve all that. But not only that, Kathy Weiner's wife worked with Judge McGinty and Judge McGinty and Judge McGinty was the second judge that I had in the custody trial for my son. So I didn't have any more questions after, oh, he, when I said, well, your wife works with Judge McGinty, she's the secretary, I'm not surprised you don't want to see the black and white. And he said, don't threaten me, young lady. I said, it's not a threat, it's just the truth of what it is. It's not, it's, I'm not saying it to threaten you, I'm just saying it is, that's all that it is. And the budget for CPS foster care went from, Four point, I think it was like 1.7 to 3.9 in one year. And I spoke at that meeting and they, and I, and I uh, told them what happened to me, what CPS did, because I took a look at the funding you can get on the site and, and, and they, they said, what are we doing? Breaking up families. That's what they said after they heard what I had to say, but still nothing got done. And I'm far from the only victim of this, um, even in my own area. I've, I've done a lot of advocacy stuff. Um, I've also done a lot to support other women or even men who've lost their children the same way that I have. I haven't done it for any type of money. I just did it to sometimes just get on the floor and get in the corner with them while they're crying and they're all broken up because they don't have their kids and they're fighting hard to try to get them back. Because I know what it's like to feel all alone, curled up in your bed, not knowing what to do. So for the people that are going, I mean, ultimately, I think we've we talked about legislative, you know, change being necessary, but it's pretty obvious based on your interaction with it that, well, it's political. And so good luck with that because they're, yeah. you know, they're not interested There's, in the black and white, like you just said. Court appointed lawyers are paid through that through the legislation, yeah. so yes, and foster care. But they said they have no jurisdiction. That's what they said. Oh, the jurisdictional arguments, huh? Yeah. 
Uh, well, Judy, what advice do you have for people who are right now fighting for their children, going through some of the same things that you were going through? What, what advice do you have for them? Um, the first thing that I would say is don't ever give up. Don't give up hope. If you feel like you're giving up on hope, find a friend, find somebody who cares, but your kids need you. So don't give up. Try to become a part of the change. Reach out and hold somebody. Speak up. Get therapy. And you're um you are continuing your advocacy efforts. Um, even long past everything is, is finished. Is, isn't it true you have a, a book coming out pretty soon? A book coming out. I'm working on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'm writing the book so that I can hope to educate people in what Munchausen by proxy is. So that something like this doesn't happen again to another child, maybe even earlier on in their life, like, through their childhood and then into the second generation, like it did to me. I don't want to see another child abused and ignored or even many children's lives are taken. So mostly I want to write the book to tell my story, to encourage others who are even working in the CPS field or in family court or county legislation that this is real. And that they can make a difference too. They can make a difference just like I can make a difference. We can work together and change it. We don't have to keep it like this. We can bring families together. Kids need their parents. As long as they're not being abused, there's got to be a way to turn it around. So that's what I'm writing the book. Yes, ma'am. Hope. Well, Judy, yes. could you believe that we've been uh, we've been talking for like an hour and seventeen minutes already about all of this <laughs> <Did> stuff? <it? laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate you and everyone else for listening. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And I, I'm, I guess my message to you is um, thank you for coming on the show for one to uh, educate everybody about what you went through and what people continue to go through. And um, furthermore of all of the cases uh, that I've heard about and yours is one of the worst and for everything that you've been through to continue to advocate the way that you are, uh, you truly are a warrior for the cause. And thank you for everything that you're doing. And um, you are a shining example uh, for exactly how you fight these kinds of cases. It might be stacked against you. The deck might be stacked. The system might be stacked against you. But if you're just going to sit down and take it, then um, there's no change. It's not going to get any better. It's been this way for a long time. It's about time that things start changing. And it starts with people like Judy Tienkin and her efforts. Um for everybody else that has uh, been listening from the very beginning, and there are a few of you out there, um, thank you so much for listening to you all, all the way through the end. Um, for all of you participating on the live show, thank you for doing that. I will let you know, however, when you're watching the live show, you're getting the show with all of the, all of the, the unedited version. And so the edited version comes out uh, usually uh, tomorrow around noon. And so if you're looking for that, that'll be out. And of course, um, if you prefer to listen to this show on a podcast, which would be my preference, um, then that's going to be, uh, we'll be releasing that version probably later this afternoon on whatever your podcast carrier of choice. Judy, thank you again for joining us. And, thank you. Um, we will, uh, <laughs> sorry. Really appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for the rest of you guys, we will see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Thank you all for listening to the entire podcast. We really do appreciate that. And as always, you can find us on YouTube on the Tilted Warrior Podcast YouTube channel or on your podcast carrier of choice. If you feel we've presented anything of value, please leave a five-star rating, like, and subscribe. We always appreciate that kind of thing. And we do look forward to seeing you all again live every Thursday at 3 in the afternoon. We love you all. Take care.